Today is July 5th, 2012. My name is Rosalind Benjet, and I am at the home of Hermine Salinger to take her oral history, and we thank her very much. Um, Hermine, tell me about your family. Where did they live? Where did they come from? Well, my father came to this country from Germany when he was 16 years old by himself. And he lived in New York. Uh, knew no one. He had a, I think, I mean, I know very little about their background. What they, I do know is a little bit I was told. Uh, and he worked, I guess, in the, uh, what they call them, sweatshops. I remember him saying he worked for a, a shirt manufacturer and they slept underneath the tables where they threw all the pieces of fabric. My mother, uh, I believe, was born in Frankfurt on Main, but I'm not positive. The reason I, because the family came from Germany, from, from Frankfurt, uh, but she died when I was born. So I, uh, I never knew any of, I know she went to school in this country. I have one picture of her that she's in public school, probably in elementary school. And uh, I know there was a fa my father came from a family who all lived in Germany, a mother and a father and four brothers and three sisters. Two of the brothers were killed. One died, I think, from the flu epidemic in Germany. Another one was killed in one of the wars before the second, before the mm -hmm. first world war. Uh, one, two brothers came here. One came soon after my father did, and one came uh, during the Hitler period. They, they were one of the last family that got out. One sister went to Israel with her family during just prior to Hitler, and one sister came here with her children and her husband. Uh, my grandfather died, I believe I was in high school, and my grandmother died during the Hitler period. She mm -hmm. was denied going to a doctor to get insulin. She was probably 70 something. That was the Morgan Stern family. My mother's family, there were three girls. My mother was the youngest and four boys. And when they came to this country, I don't know. But as I said, either my mother was an infant, but that they were all here, the whole family. And that was the Schiff family. Uh, my father, when my mother died, I said he was very upset, naturally, looking for the doctor because he hadn't taken care of my mother properly. This was in New York. And uh, my uncle, who had already come to this country and was living in Arizona, happened to be in New York at the time from what I heard as a young woman, uh, almost bodily picked up my father and took him to Arizona. And they lived there for a few years. They worked for a cousin of theirs. I mean, my, what I know of their background is so limited, it's a shame it, it, that you don't know your family. Uh, anyway, he had met and gone with my stepmother before he met my mother. 
But she and her family had gone to California. This was probably 1914, 1913, something like that. In, the, in that interim period, he met my mother and fell madly in love and married. And when she died, somehow, some way, his being in Arizona, he met a relative of my stepmother who came from, oh, he came into Oklahoma when it, they, it was open. He came in on a horseback and lives, the whole family still lives What's the first town you got, get to when you go to Oklahoma from here? Anyway, it's all over. They, they know this family. And he told my father that Tessie Schumack was back in New York. The family had come back to New York. So they started corresponding. And in 1917 or 1918, he went to New York and they married. And he brought this woman who had never been out of civilized country, California, New York, to Bisbee, Arizona, and to have heard her story. This woman who, who knew nothing, they, they lived up, I think, four flights of stairs from the road to their house. She had to learn about cooking, and the things she did were absolutely hysterical. Uh, in his working, he bought a, a ranch or something. Anyway, they had a car, and they went out there, and uh, the car stopped. And he left her in the car to go find help. And she's in that car, and the coyotes all, I mean, this, these were stories I heard. Anyway, I lived with an aunt and uncle when my mother died. Uh, they took me, and I think all families did things like that those years. And I was raised, they were my parents. My father, when he'd come to New York, I knew him as, as my uncle, and I adored him. There, there was just a deep feeling. And until I was nine, uh, that was my background. I was raised in Richmond Hill in New York, and uh, went to school there. And when I was nine years old, my parents, my father, had moved from, Breck from Arizona to Breckenridge, Texas, to Panhandle, Texas, which was a, a whistle stop. And he opened a store there. And I was sent, nine years old, on a train, two days traveling in, uh, in, with a Pullman, to St. Louis, and that's where they were buying for the store. At that time, my aunt told me the story of my mother died when I was born, and that Uncle Saul was really my father, and Aunt Tessie was now, would now be my mother. So they met me in St. Louis, and that was my first drive to Texas. Mm -hmm. And I remember that to this day. I remember my father, we passed a lake someplace, and he said, you better watch, look at that lake, because it's the last water you're going to see <laughs> for a long time. And it wasn't probably, you know, this is, I'm 96 years old, so this is a long time ago. I remember it sitting in the car, and suddenly there's like an ocean in front of me. And I said, you know, why did you tell me I wouldn't look at that ocean in front of you? I mean, I can remember the waves, and it was a mirage. I had never seen a mirage in my life. 
and it was a mirage in the road. So these were all my experiences. We came to this tiny little town of Panhandle. Where is Panhandle? It's up in the Panhandle of Texas. It's the north, it's the square part of Texas, north of here, about 600 miles north of Dallas, almost at the end of Texas, close to Oklahoma, Colorado, New Mexico, at the corners. And that was quite an experience from someone who came from school, dancing lessons, you know, the whole thing, to this little town. What year would that have been This was, well, I was born in 1916, so this was 1925. Mm -hmm. And I was there for, we lived in the last house on the last street in Panhandle. I mean, there was nothing but prairie in back of us, in front of us, etc. I went to school there for a year, elementary school, and I was uh, unique in that I didn't speak the language of these children. There were children there from Oklahoma who spoke differently than the children from Texas. And here is this New Yorker with a New York accent. Plus, the only Jew for uh, hundreds of miles around, probably. So uh, it was quite an experience. And but I made a lot of friends as growing up. We lived there for a little over a year, and my father opened a store in Borger, Texas, which is about 30 miles north of Panhandle. It was an oil town, a boom town. My father followed the booms. He went from Breckenridge, which was an oil boom, to Borger, which was an oil boom, and opened a store there. But it was anything you see on the movie of oil towns in Texas in those years could never, never, never tell the story that what it was actually was. Uh, so he wouldn't let us live there. He, he, living there was very impossible. So my mother and I lived in Amarillo, and I went to a Catholic school because he felt I'd be, she'd be easier to take care of me, that she'd know where I was. I wasn't a boarding student, I was a day student. But again, needless to say, the only Jewish student in a Catholic girls' school. But to this day, I, I preciously enjoy and appreciate anything and everything I learned in that school. It made a great deal of me what I am today. Uh, I had all the respect and I was never in any way did they try to change me or I, in fact I sang in the choir in those days I could sing uh, but I mean I was not Catholic, and it was understood, and that was it. Uh, I lived, I went to the Catholic school for a little over six years, and then uh, we moved, my mother and I moved to uh, Borger. And I finished my high school, a year and a half of high school, in Borger, Texas, which was another, I mean, my whole life was, how would you say, from New York to Texas to a little bitty farm community in Texas, from a Catholic school where everything was 
you followed rules and regulations to a wide open, very not very good public school where very few of the students ever went beyond the education they had. Uh, but it was, again, a wonderful experience. The countryside, all, all of this, plus the country, the, the, the atmosphere, the openness of the land made me what I am today. Mm -hmm. It's, it had a great, all of this had a great influence in my life. Did you have any contact at all with any other Jewish families while you were living there? Not until, uh, well, no, I shouldn't say that. When I was in school in Amarillo, the Catholic school, they um, built a temple. My mother and I were, and father, were practically ostracized because I was in a Catholic school. But when the temple was built, they wanted to have a confirmation class. And so I was invited. No background, no study, no Sunday school, nothing. Uh, we had a confirmation class. I don't know if you knew Minnie Salmonson. You did, I'm sure. Minnie Salmonson lived in Amarillo, Jewish, and we were in the same confirmation class. I was the oldest and I think the tallest. There were a few boys and a few girls, and we had a confirmation. And when that was over, that was the end of any Jewish background, Jewish learning that I had. And believe me, I didn't learn anything. Uh, did your family celebrate the holidays or anything? Uh, we knew, uh, I never knew about Hanukkah, and we knew Passover because uh, the delicatessen in Amarillo would send us a car, send my mother a card, she'd order some matzahs, and we never celebrated as I've done with my family. And it was just because we didn't know. By the time I was 11, we would come, my father would come to Dallas anyway to buy merchandise from the store. We'd come for services, either for Rosh Hashanah or for Young Kipper. And uh, that started some of my Jewish learning as a religion. I always knew I was Jewish, and of course I was always taught by my father. In German would say to me, you have to be a bigger mensch. Why? Because you're Jewish. You all heard it, I'm sure. And one day I had great disturbance. I said, how big do I have to be? And he said, bigger. <laughs> and I remember that, to, and that's just the way, bigger. <laughs> And, but we see after services, we'd go over to, we went to Temple Emanuel, and we'd go over to Rabbi Lefkowitz's home, which was about a block from the temple, and he would give my father Sunday school books that I would have if, at my age mm -hmm. if I lived in Dallas. Well, unfortunately, they weren't read that much. Uh, really, I became, as I said, inwardly, and I don't know why, but inwardly, and from my ma father telling me I was Jewish, and you never could convince me otherwise, and I would never change from that. I felt it very deeply. 
when I got married, it's when I learned about my Jewishness. But you went to high school in Borger? In Borger, graduated mm -hmm. in 1933, and went to the University of Texas. I went there for two years, two and a half years, when my father became very ill, and I went home and took him down to Mineral Wells, and I took care of the store. So uh, that ended that part. I was there home for a year, and uh, well, I wanted to be a doctor. I was going to cure the world of every illness. But I realized I didn't have the mental capacity or the physical capacity to go through that. So I decided I'd be a therapist and I wanted to go either to Galveston Medical School or to uh, Colorado College University. And we, there was a gentleman from Dallas used to come to that to Borger to really go all over to sell insurance. His name was Mr. Flance. And of course he was, I found out, orthodox. And so he'd come to our house to eat. And I remember, he, you know, no meat and all of that. The, these were things I heard about from my father, but had never witnessed it or seen it. And he told my father about this wonderful school, SMU, in Dallas. And of course, the Jewish population, how good it would be for me. And I would meet young people, and it would be a much better environment. Well, I knew, after having been at University of Texas, I knew about SMU. It was what they called a tea-sipping school. It was a social school, and I didn't want any part of it. And But he finally saw his way, and I came to SMU. Well, I had spent the summer up in the mountains in New Mexico, and I told them, if I don't like SMU, I can leave in six weeks and get my money back, and I'm coming up here and spent the winter. Well, P.S., I met a young lawyer. And that was the end of my going to New Mexico or leaving SMU. Mm -hmm. So I met Alfred. Uh, that September was 1936, and we married in 1938. Had a very good marriage. Had a very beautiful, happy marriage. Four children, seven grandchildren, 12 great-grandchildren. And both of, us, both of us had been active in the Jewish community and in the normal community. We both loved it. Let's go back to where you met him. How did you meet your husband? Again, through this gentleman, Mr. Flance. I lived on, I had a room uh, on South Boulevard. And Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Flance lived about a block from me. And she could call me one day and invited me to, these were the days you still sat outside, you know, on, on your chairs out in the lawn. And this was South Boulevard where I guess a great many, well, South Dallas is where most of the Jewish people lived then. And so you knew everybody, you knew everything there was to know about anybody on the street, good, bad, or indifferent, and you heard about it sitting on the lawn. <laughs> so she had told me to, to come over that evening that uh, Mr. Salinger was coming and she'd like me to meet him and for him to meet me. 
So and this is a true story. I uh, I told her I was sorry, but I had a date, which I did with a young man that I had gone with it in Austin. So she said, well, Mr. Salas is going to be there, let's say, 8 o'clock. And being trying to be polite and nice, I said, well, my date was at 7.30, but we'll drive around, and I'll be at your house at 8 o'clock. And at 8 o'clock, here's Mrs. Flans and her friends sitting around, and Mr. Salinger isn't there yet. So about 15 to 20 minutes later, here he comes walking up the street, suited and hatted. Now, he was from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, had lived in Dallas already. He graduated from law school in 1933. So he, he was pretty well settled in Dallas. And we met, had the usual conversation, how do you like SMU, how do you like Dallas? And I finally looked at him and I said, Mr. Salinger, you kept me waiting for 15 minutes, and I don't wait for anybody. <laughs> Good night. And I left. I mean, I didn't care if I ever saw him again. So two weeks later, Mrs. Flans called me and invited me for Sunday lunch. Unbeknownst to me, she had invited Mr. Salinger. And I'm sure, unbeknownst to Mr. Salinger, he didn't know she invited me. Well, we were both in the spot. He had to ask me for a day, and I had to accept. Right? Well, the, the centennial was on. It was the second year of the centennial, and I had not been because the summer before I had spent the summer in New York. Well, we went. We walked. We were close, we walked, and he was nice. I mean, he was human, and he was friendly, and, and he was nice. And on the way back, we were walking down Forest Avenue, and there was an ice cream store on the corner, and he asked me if I'd like a cone. I thought, this guy is human. <laughs> so we're walking down the street, and, and we're eating ice cream cone, and having a wonderful conversation, and that was, that started. Mm -hmm. So, when uh, Thanksgiving came, I was going home for the holidays, and invited him to come with us, with me. So we, of course in those days you travel by train, and that's when I had my first proposal. And I turned him down because he didn't dance. <laughs> and I loved dancing. I told him I'm sorry, but I love to dance and tough. You know, these things happen. So when Christmas holidays came and I went home, of course I was home for two weeks, and I decided I missed him. I, I guess he meant something to me. So that started the romance. We married in August of 1937, 38. Here in Dallas? In Dallas. Uh, from 1938 on, well, even before that, from 1935, 36, everything in our life has been here in Dallas. Mm -hmm. And how did he come to live in Dallas? That's as far as his money would take him. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 that's as far as it would go. And he knew about the law school here. He had already he had started school in Duquesne, in mm -hmm. Pittsburgh, and wanted to get away from Pittsburgh and family and all. He went to Alabama 
and then was ready for law school. And he really wanted to go to Atlanta, uh, to Alaska. He had heard about, he thought that would be a wonderful time to start out something new. But as I say, he ran out of money. Mm -hmm. And from what I understand, he, he did a lot of walking from SMU to downtown Dallas. He, he, he was a poor boy and finished law school and entered a good law firm and eventually became head of it. So it's, he was a good guy. Mm -hmm. He was very special. Now, what interests did you have at that point in, when you were studying? Oh, science. Mm -hmm. Although I, I love psychology, I love anything dealing with people. Mm -hmm. I liked history. I studied a lot of history, but like science. Mm -hmm. And you had four children. Yeah. When, when were they born? Uh, my son was born in 1939, my oldest daughter in 41. And I it unfortunately had to wait six years. They didn't know if I could have any more. And in 1947, Needs. Needs. my uh, third child was born in 1950, my fourth child. Okay. So and I had one son are... and three daughters. Okay, and what are their names? Don. Salinger, Carolyn, well, Salinger Healthman, Joyce Salinger, and Mary Beth Harrison. Um, now, these were all the years of the Depression and World War II. Did that affect the family at all? Well, my husband was in service. I had the two children and we lived here. Uh, no, I, I can't. The depression was on when I was in school, mm -hmm. and but it really, you know, when my children were, do you remember the uh, soup lines? And I said, no. The only thing I remember is seeing it in the newspaper, or hearing about it on radio. It was long before TV. Uh, it affected. I'm sure business-wise was affected, but no way like it was a beast. Uh, and of course, my father never let on that things were slower, which I'm sure they were. Uh, World War II, my husband was gone for a year. Uh, I knew there were shortages, mm -hmm. and we did without. It, it wasn't any hardship. You just knew it had to be that way, and that was the way it was. And where did you live when you first got married? We lived in, well, the first house, we, the first apartment we had was over here off of Oak Lawn, and then we moved into a house on Willis, in East Dallas, <laughs> that was the experience. There was so much space between the outer doors and the windows. I, I had everything stuffed with towels and newspaper. <laughs> I mean, it, it, and we had, I remember we didn't have bed tables. So I got orange crates. Do you remember orange crates? Mm -hmm. The wooden orange crates? Those were my end tables. And um, I remember Alfred's first birthday, which was in December. And believe me, I knew nothing of what I know today about having parties and so forth and certainly couldn't afford, he was a young attorney. We couldn't afford, you know, a lot of big things. 
So, uh, and I had never done any cooking. I remember the first cookies I made, <laughs> the pan was a solid thing of dough. There, there was something I didn't do right. <laughs> anyway, we had invited, we had a lot of older friends that Alfred knew. When he lived with a family by the name of Mittenthal, and they just took him under their wing. So I was brought into that. Most of my friends at that time were the older people who, not quite my parents' age, but a little bit getting in there. So I had invited them all for Alfred's birthday party. And for decorations, and whenever I see these things, you know the Bodard apples? <laughs> we went out in the country and picked those. I just bought back maybe 25, 30, and I sprayed them with uh, shellac or something like that, and then sprinkled glitter all over them. And that was my table decoration. So it wasn't too bad, you know. <laughs> And life was good. Uh, I, I really feel badly for the younger people today because they have everything. They, they don't know what it means to save a little bit, to wait until you have things that... that it, it was good. Mm -hmm. it, it was a good life. And from there we moved to uh, an apartment on South Boulevard. We lived in the second floor of a two-family apartment, and that's where my son was born. And my husband was teaching Sunday school at Temple Emanuel. We lived at one end of South Boulevard, and of course, the temple was at South Boulevard in Harwood. And on Sundays, I'd get my son bathed and put him in his buggy, and we'd start, you heard me, we'd start down South Boulevard to go meet my husband. We'd never got more than two blocks because <laughs> everybody knew us and everybody would come out to see the baby. So it, it, was, it, it was a wonderful life. And none of us knew that, I guess, we were poor. I don't think so. We, we had furniture. We had a big, lovely apartment. We, we weren't wanting for anything. So, uh, we, and we lived there until we, no, then we bought a, a cottage. Again, in uh, Monticello, off of Greenville. And from there, we bought our first home in University Park. Mm -hmm. And where did your children go to school? My children, what, they all went to uh, Highland Park schools. They graduated from Highland Park High School. My son went to Washington and Lee University in Virginia. My daughter, oldest daughter, went to, Saint, uh, to uh, Washington University in St. Louis graduated, they both graduated. Uh, my oldest daughter went to Arizona and she went to a private school there, uh, high school, and she was very ill and so never finished. She finally finished college here at, uh, what was it, Brookhaven. My youngest daughter they, they all went to graduate from Highland Park High School, went to Oklahoma University, married when she was young, before she finished university, and has two sons. But uh, they all lived here. They all married and all lived here. All my grandchildren were born here. So it's... It's been a full life and a good one. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that uh, your husband was teaching Sunday school uh -huh. at Temple Emmanuel. He taught confirmation class. Mm -hmm. 
And were you as a family active at the temple? Oh, yeah. Yeah. What kinds of things did you do? Well, until I taught one year of Sunday school, but basically my background, my, my being a teacher meant I stayed one class, one book ahead of the kids. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my husband had a good background in Judaism. And um, I knew that wasn't going to work good for me. So it wasn't until my children started Sunday school, because they all started from kindergarten on up, uh, I became active in whatever they needed in Sunday school. And now, I've been volunteering at Temple for years. It's, it's what I call my second home. Even though I don't go to services like I should every Friday, it's a special place for me. I, I feel that way, and it's, it's an important thing. Were you involved in any other organizations? Uh, B'nai B'rith Women. Mm -hmm. I was active. In fact, I'm a past president. Uh, I was active for a number of years in National Council of Jewish Women. I was secretary for a short time for sisterhood, but I didn't care for sisterhood. That was not for me. So. I did a lot of Red Cross work during the Second World War, and I did a lot of outside things that developed into things. I, I was very aware of people who, remember when after the Second World War when there was an excess of staples like butter and margarine and lard and, mm -hmm. and flour and and that they were giving this to people who had nothing but they didn't know what to do with it they didn't have the refrigeration and so forth and this bothered me so I became well for a while I was part of the uh, forget what it was called, it was a state organization that looked into daycare and I was involved in that for a while and through that I I guess I was a starter with it, a pioneer in it. I'd go around and teach how to use some of the things that you had, that they had, that they didn't know what to do with. And it was all through a city thing that I became involved. Uh, got had a group of women that I worked with that were wonderful. Some of the black women I worked with were absolutely marvelous. I remember this because this was the time that Martin Luther King was so popular, so wonderful. And one of the women I worked with, I loved her dearly, she would get so angry with me because she said, you're more black than I am. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but we'd go around and we went to all these small all these small communities. I remember going to Rockwall. It was nothing but a, a little country farm town and Mesquite, the streets were still dirt. Uh, the, I remember Edie Kuhn, they had, her husband was a salesman with wonderful peace goods. She gave us boxes of fabric that we take with us and we taught these women, these black women taught them how to make, make their houses a little more beautiful. 
We go into West Dallas, which was such a poverty-stricken area, and teach them, if you have a can, an empty can, put a little paper around it and go pick some weeds and put them on your table, have a little color, just anything to help improve their life. It, it was one of the, the main things that I did that I, I loved doing, mm -hmm. to teach them that there was more in life than living day by day, mm -hmm. just with nothing. And I'm told that you were also a painter. Yes. How did you become interested in art? When I got through doing organization work, I got tired of politics, which it became very involved, and I let me do what I want to do my way and leave me alone. Well, organizations don't run that way. <laughs> so I wanted to do something to give me something to do. And for a while I did needlepoint, I did some needlework. I never knitted. I did a lot of embroidery, but I wanted to paint. I wanted to learn to paint, to paint what I hear when I hear listen to music. So I learned that they were teaching art at the J. And I called some friends, and you know, when you call people, this one wanted to go Monday morning, and the other one couldn't go to Tuesday night, and so forth. I, I didn't know oil from water, from anything else. I just wanted to paint. And finally, I met a gentleman by the name of Bud Biggs, who was a watercolorist, had classes. And I joined his class. Well, it was pretty bad. I got into a class a Thursday night where everyone in that class had painted for years. And I understood, I understood later that they had a bed going on, a pot going on with a bed, that I wasn't going to last three weeks. Well, I tell the story, and it's very, I'm very honest about it. The only reason they let me stay, they liked my cooking, and they liked the parties I gave. <laughs> we lived on Beverly Drive in a very big house, and for five years, we had all the Christmas parties for about 40 or 45 people. And when any of the visiting artists would come, at that time they started the Watercolor Society here, and we'd always have artists from all over the country come to teach a workshop. Half of them we would entertain in our house. So I said they let me stay because they liked my cooking. I painted, it was in the late 70s when I started, and my painting until about 11, 12 years ago was very spasmodic because when my oldest daughter was getting a divorce, she had three children, so she needed help. And it was more important that I help her with the children mm -hmm. than to paint. So I missed a lot of classes. Then my middle daughter became very ill and my time was devoted to her. So I painted very, very little. Uh, then things sort of quieted down a little bit and I was able to paint and go to classes. Then my husband became ill. In the last three years of his life, I painted three paintings in three years. I just, I didn't have the time. I didn't want to take the time. I didn't have the heart in it. Mm -hmm. He died about 14 years ago, and since then, 
I have painted and have had paintings accepted in art classes, in art shows. Great. And I'm very happy. How do you think Dallas changed since you came oh. to live here? <laughs> How did Dallas change? Yes. Mm. There were streetcars. I remember from SMU downtown, you took a streetcar, trolley. There wasn't the traffic that there is today. There wasn't the Central Expressway. You you knew where everybody lived. You, you, you there wasn't the formality that it is today. Dallas has always been a special place. It's always been a wealthy city. Uh, Highland Park was, I remember when we moved there, people were amazed because it just wasn't the place where a lot of Jewish people came. Uh, downtown Dallas, the, the main building downtown was the flying, red, uh, uh, flying horse. That's how you knew you were coming into Dallas. Uh, some of the streets, I remember Royal Lane was a two-lane two road, and on the corner of Marsh, in Midway, I think, Midway and Royal Lane, there was a huge, huge pecan tree in the middle of the road, and to get around it, you, you drove around. Yeah. But when you want to meet people, you said, we'll meet you at the pecan tree. So uh, SMU, my husband went to SMU Law School. The law school was the top of the Dallas Hall, the rotunda. And as he used to say, you'd look out north, north of what was supposedly Northwest Highway, a two-lane road, was nothing but cotton field. All of this was cotton field. Mm -hmm. And tell us about your family today. Oh, they're wonderful. My son is an attorney. All my children except one daughter lives here. Uh, my grandchildren, I have one granddaughter lives in Maryland. My oldest daughter lives in Maryland, in uh, Baltimore. Uh, my one grandchild lives my, the rest of my grand, my children live here. My grandchildren, I have one in Chevy Chase, Maryland, one in California, one in Austin, Texas, and the rest live here in Dallas or in the Plano Fairview in this area. Uh, speaking of Fairview, I have grandchildren living up there now. I remember when we drive up to Fairview because there was a large nursery up there and we'd go up there to buy plants. There was nothing up there with cotton fields. Have you been to Fairview? Go up there and look. They never have to come to Dallas. It's every store. It is marvelous. It's unbelievable how McKinney, Texas, was a farm town. Have you been up there lately? I mean, that's. I remember during the Second World War when Richardson, Texas, still had some wood walkways in front of the stores. So. Dallas has changed and has grown. The thing that breaks my heart, and I have talked about it and written, I don't write to them anymore, councilmen, that they have, they're beginning to wake up about Oak Cliff and South Dallas. It is a beautiful, beautiful area of Dallas County. Hilly, water, trees, it's gorgeous, and that they, the only reason they let that go 
was because a few politicians had enough money that they bought this land out north. No trees, no water, no hills, just flat land. And they sold it and people bought it and left Oak Cliff and South Dallas go its way. It's, it's waking up. It's coming to. <laughs> You had, your folks had business in South Dallas. Actually, they called it North Dallas then because it was Pearl Street where today the Windspear and the AT&T yeah. were forming. Okay. But that was called, it was still North Dallas because yeah. it wasn't anything further down. Yeah. The same time you lived in South Dallas. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. I haven't talked so much in... When? A long time. <laughs> well, you did it beautifully. You made it very easy for Roz, correct? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> I don't know of what interest any of this would be to anybody. Oh. Well, we have researchers who come in to the Historical Society. Um, many times they're looking for demographics. Where did people live in the city at what time? Uh, what kind of organizations were important to the people? Well, at for instance, various periods in Borger, Texas, there were, I think, five Jewish families. I was the oldest child, uh, but there are a lot of Jewish people whose background came from some of these little bitty towns in mm -hmm. Texas. It's amazing. Bob Strauss, mm -hmm. Ted Strauss, they came from up that, that way. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. And also, Hermine, I'll bring you one to let you read it. We put together uh, three years ago mm -hmm. 200 past oral histories that had gone back to what, 19... 1940? No, I think she started them in the late 60s. That late? Right? Ginger? Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, ones that had been sitting on a shelf in our, at, the, at the time we were in a small place with a closet, and they were sitting on the shelf, and we got volunteers, thanks to Cheryl Bowman, yeah. and uh, they transcribed, abbreviating it, condensing it rather, and then we took those and we had them printed with photos. And I'll show you the book. It's awesome. If you're, oh, when you're, are you going to be at eat? Well, let me turn this off. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful interview. But we, we, I think you might enjoy reading the book.